Welcome again on the kings of Israel. And we have arrived now in this session at the reign of Jehoash. Jehoash. And uh, he was the second of the kings that issued from the bowels, if I could say this, of Jehu. God had promised Jehu whom he raised up to kill all the seed of Ahab because of his wickedness. And Jehu did that. And God promised him four sons thereafter, or four that followed him, that would indeed sit upon his throne. Well now, we come to Jehoash. And I want to look at this man, we'll call him Jehoash because... Uh, so often, uh, so often in the scripture, the E-H is missed out, and Joash uh, is the name that is used, and it's easier for us to speak of Joash than Jehoash. Well, anyway, I want to look at this king with you, because at the time of Joash, Elisha, the prophet of God, was still living. You know... Uh, Joash um, knew Elisha and uh, Elisha of course all his miracles that he had done and uh, now Elisha is nigh unto death and the king of Israel hears about this and he goes to the house of Elisha and he weeps, and he weeps, and he weeps. He cries, laying upon the body of Elisha. Elisha's still living, and he's crying out, Oh, my father, my father, my father. So here is the king of Israel acknowledging that his spiritual father is Elisha, the great prophet of God. And all that Elisha stands for, he is acknowledging, he is acknowledging, yes, this is my spiritual father. This is my spiritual father. My father, my father, my father. And he's weeping because it's time for Elisha to be taken. And uh, Elisha is giving him instructions on what to do to take some arrows and smite them on the ground. And the king in obedience takes his arrows but only hits the ground three times and oh Elisha is angry. He said, look, you should have hit about six times because that is a sign that you will defeat Syria. But you're only going to defeat them three times because you only hit them three times and they'll rise again. Had you hit them six times, it would have been that uh, you would have had absolute dominion over them. Well, now, the moment that Elisha is going to be taken and uh, the eyes of the king are obviously opened and he sees the chariots of Israel you know, to take Elisha up to heaven. Now, you know, that has occurred in the life of Elijah too. When Elisha was watching and uh, Elijah was to take up to heaven and here come the chariots of Israel and come between the two, the living and the dead. You know, that's a very real situation. And I've experienced it. You know, we had a young girl in our Bible school in Switzerland. And uh, she's a very godly young girl. And uh, she was struck with leukemia. And uh, six months before she died, she was constantly seeking God, getting her life right before God. And uh, then she became weaker and weaker. You know, she was sent to a hospital but the hospital said we can do nothing for her. And we talked to the uh, 
doctor and said, uh, well, can we bring her back to the hotel because the, the uh, Bible school was situated in a hotel that we owned. And uh, he said, oh, yes, he was a Christian man. He said, that would be wonderful to be surrounded by the prayers of her friends and her family because her father and mother were there, you know, before the Lord takes her or if he heals her, whatever he chooses. Well, we used to pray around Madeline, that was her name, around her bed. And then one morning it became very evident that this was going to be her last day on earth. And we were praying about seven pastors there. We were holding hands around her bed and you know, holding Madeline's hands. And we formed a circle around her and we were praying. And oh, the power of God. And then I, I cried out, Oh, the chariots of Israel. As these chariots, these angelic beings in chariots, passed across the bed, separating her from us. And then I saw right into heaven, the gates of heaven, and uh, a path coming right the way down to Madeline's bed. And then in a moment or two, it was the Lord himself walking down that pathway. And of course, it's a tremendous distance, but he covered it very quickly. And he came down, touched Madeline. She came out of her body clothed in spotless, sparkling white garment. And he offered her his arm. And it was like... The bride and the bridegroom, they walked up to heaven together. And so, these things are very real to me. You know, we look at scripture and we say, uh, well, were they only for those days? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, what you read in scripture, you know, abounds everywhere. And uh, I had that experience. Well, now, coming back to this king, he has made a declaration. Elisha is his father. Is his father. Well, scripture tells us we should honor our father. We should walk in his ways and the like. But even acknowledging Elisha was his father, do we find that the king walked in the ways of Elisha? No. As we've so often said about these kings of Israel, they all knew the truth and they made a decision. You know, rather than walk in the ways of truth that were clearly spelled out before them. You know, this king embracing Elisha, my father, my father. He went to the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and he embraced them. You know, it reminds me of an event that took place and I cannot remember the exact year but perhaps something like 1909, something like that. And on the throne of England there was a man by the name of King Edward VII. Now, he was the first son of Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert of Sex Coburg. And he had a life, a life of absolute wickedness. And for 60 years, because he didn't come to the throne until the age of 60, because Queen Victoria had a very long life. And uh, he was an extremely immoral man, extremely immoral man. In fact, uh, you know, England have more or less given up on him. But when he came to the throne, he became a wonderful king, a wonderful king. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, monarchs give audiences, and uh, part of their time is receiving people from all walks of life in their kingdom, talking to them and perhaps helping them. And on one of these occasions, 
King Edward the Seventh was giving an audience to William Booth of the Salvation Army. Now, at that time, the Salvation Army had been much maligned, but it was gaining credence in England, and nobody could doubt, you know, the tremendous uh, humanitarian work they did although William Booth made it very clear that wasn't to be the main thrust of the Salvation Army, it was to win souls, but in winning them, but you've got to look after them physically. And so he had his soup kitchens and the like, you see, and looked after the poor of England. Well, here he is, ushered into the presence of King Edward VII. And the King Edward VII inquired solicitously of William Booth's health, which was not too good at that time, and he was having trouble with his eyes. And uh, the king was asking about, you know, the work of the army and commending William Booth. And William Booth said this to the king. He said, Your Majesty, do you approve of the work that we are doing in England? And the king leaned forward and said, yes, I do. William Booth then said, we have a convention, your majesty. May I make that declaration before this convention that we're going to have that I have met you in audience and you have given your approval to the work of the Salvation Army. The king leaned forward and said, you can. You can quote me that I approve of your work. Well now, looking at that, you would say, well, the king had had a change of heart and the king was on the road to salvation. Oh no. You see, the king acknowledged that what William Booth was doing was right. He acknowledged the message of William Booth. Yes, that was right. But you know, he continued with his mistresses. In fact, I think it's the great, great, great granddaughter of uh, his mistress who's now married to the Prince of Wales. Shocking situation. But um, there you are. So here he is saying, yes, you can say that the King of England approves the work of the Salvation Army. And uh, William Booth was ecstatic. And so in the convention, he made that statement. I have met the King of England. I have met King Edward VII. And he gives approval to our work. Well, once William Booth had said that, that changed the face of England. Here was the king giving approval. So immediately everything changed. And the whole of England now looked at the Salvation Army in quite a different way. The king approves, so we must approve too. And in fact, he, uh, William Booth had a, another audience with, uh, uh, I think it was the uh, Queen, uh, Queen Alexandria, and uh, the Queen of Russia, and uh, one of the daughters anyway. And uh, they too gave their approval to the work of the Salvation Army and actually admired. But did that change them? Did that change them? Well, no, it did not. You see, King Edward VII became a very good king, a very good king, far better than Queen Victoria, who had been most difficult. And her prime ministers have said, oh, the most difficult time in the whole week is when we have to go and have an audience with the Queen. She is so difficult. And they were enraptured by the uh, new king, King Edward VII. And in fact, uh, uh, France was uh, taken up by the king with the Entente Cordiale. You know, they thought, oh, what a wonderful king this king of England is. And he was fated everywhere. He was a good king. He was a good king. He did that which was right. All right, he gave his approval to the Salvation Army. But, 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 did he walk in it? Oh, no. 
he had this mistress and several others, a number of others, but anyway, um, right up to the end. And how did he die? Well, this is what one of his equerries said. Just before he died, when the doctors have said, Your Majesty, there is no hope. We can do nothing for you. And uh, here at the age of, I think it was about 69, here he was on his deathbed. And do you know what it, uh, the equerry said? He sent one of his equerries to the uh, British Society, the propagation of the gospel, for a, a pamphlet. And this pamphlet was a sinner's prayer. And when the king got it, the equerry said, he read it with such fervor and such, you know, desire. Well, the funeral of the king, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, and the various other bishops lifted him up to high heaven. But you know, the truth came out. <coughs> With someone else who made this statement, they said, if our theology is right, far from being in the highest courts of heaven, he is in the depths of hell. You see, you can be a good king, you can acknowledge the truth of the gospel, you can even read the sinner's prayer, but is that going to get you in? Oh no, you have to live the life, you have to live the life. You see, he lived in pleasure for 69 years, lived in adultery, but, you know, at the end, where is he? Well, he's not where the archbishops put him in the highest courts of heaven. He's in the depths of hell. And you see, this is what I want to bring out and delineate when we consider Joash. You see, to acknowledge the truth, to say like to William Booth, you know, oh, you're doing a good work. You know, you can quote me as saying it. And, you know, for Joash to be on the deathbed of Elisha and say, oh yes, you're my spiritual father. You know, that is not going to get you into heaven. To acknowledge the way, to acknowledge, oh yes, the Bible is right. You know, the son of uh, King Edward VII, George V, uh, was asked by the uh, British Bible Society, you know, for the propagation of the gospel, Your Majesty, would you uh, approve, would you become the patron of um, the Bishop Bible Society? He said, oh yes, he said, I read the Bible, my mother made me give a promise to read the, a chapter in the Bible every day. And he said, I've kept my word to my mother. But you see, that is not sufficient. You know, it is that we have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the concern of our hearts is this, that you be not tricked into thinking that, oh yes, you know, as long as I read the Bible, as long as I, you know, give my assent to those who do good, then I should be all right. Oh no, 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 no. Now you've got to live the life, you see. King Edward the Seventh, you know, gave his assent to the Salvation Army, but he did not walk in the ways of the Salvation Army. You know, William Booth is a very interesting man. And, uh, you know, we learn a lot as leaders from him. And this is the point that I want to bring out. You see, William Booth 
you know, did an exceeding wonderful work. I mean, he stretched his hand down to those who were in the gutter or those who were the adulterers. In fact, at his funeral, the queen, the reigning queen at that time was, um, or the consort, was Queen Mary, who was the uh, wife of King George V. And she slipped in unobtrusively uh, into the convention hall where the, uh, shall I say, funeral of William Booth was being celebrated. And uh, although uh, had she made known her presence, she would have been escorted to the highest place in the hall, she chose rather to slide in, to slide in at the back. And she sat with uh, a woman, you see. And this woman, not realizing it was the queen, said to the queen, you know, he loved people like me. And this woman was a prostitute, you know, one who was discarded by humanity, rejected. And yet, William Booth, you know, his motto was, give me the poor, give me the poor. Give me those who are rejected, and I'll lift them up. Well, that was the testimony. She said, you know, he saved the, those like me. And uh, Queen Mary herself, of course, was a Christian, born-again Christian. And uh, here she was identifying with the message of William Booth. Not like her father-in-law, who gave assent but did not identify. So this is one of the serious, shall I say, truths that we learn from the kings of Israel. You see, they all were given adequate proof by God. In fact, as you look into the word of God, it seems as though the most sinful of men were given the greatest proof by God concerning what was right and what was true and what was wrong. But you know, it's not what you know, but it's what you do. And this is where we have to be so careful. You know, those people in public houses, in taverns, in these people who go and inhabit the places of sin, will often speak of religion, will often speak of the church, because they have had witness of the truth. But you know, where is God going to find you, you know, when it's your time to die? King Edward the Seventh. He lived a, a sinful life right up until the last. It was only on his deathbed that he came to his senses and caused for the sinner's prayer to be brought to him. But that was too late. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. And the one who said, well, the archbishops have lifted him up into high heaven. Well, they're wrong. He's in the depths of hell. And you see, what I'm trying to do in this series is to show you the characters of these kings of Israel, and the king of England in this case, that you can know the truth, but what do you accept? What do you choose? Yes, they're right. But are you following those that are right? And, you know, William Booth would pass by the taverns with his band and they would play and they would literally pull 
people up from the gutter and cause them to walk with them and get them sober and get them saved. You know, and one, uh, they were very demonstrative in the Salvation Army. You know, there was uh, one of his daughters, Evangeline Booth, and uh, she was preaching and she came down from the platform and she said, Sir, give me your hand. And this man was, you know, overcome. He was very surprised. He gave his hand. She pulled him right out of the chair, brought him to the platform and said, Now kneel down and get saved. You see, sometimes it needs that. And sometimes it needs a, a message like this to shake you up, to realize, look, you've got to make a decision. And you've got to come to the point, yes, I agree that the church is right. I agree the word of God is the word of God. And I'm going to do something about it. And that's where I am coming to as we close now. You do something about the truth. You ask Christ to come into your heart and let your life change. And walk in the pathway of righteousness which will take you up to heaven above. Acknowledging the truth is not sufficient. Walking in the truth is. So don't be like King Edward VII and don't be like Joash who acknowledged the truth but did not walk in the truth. And both of them are down in the pit. May God grant that your destiny will be above. God bless you.